For the past 25 years, I've been involved in the television and film business here in southern Spain. I'm an actor, producer, uh, fixer, locations, action cars. At the start of the pandemic, I could feel there was something wrong. I wasn't sure what it was, and as the weeks rolled out, it became stronger and stronger and stronger, this feeling. Now I get messages from people all over the world, from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Europe, Central South America, of course the US. And the undermining emotion in all of this is they're all saying the same thing. We feel there's something terribly wrong with the planet. All the governments have been lying to them. The media are feeding us a load of complete rubbish and nobody believes it anymore. So this is why the story about the king is so important to me. One doorway of truth will always open another doorway of truth. And these are the doors that we need to go through. The team, the audience, everybody watching, we all want the truth. So here we are a few weeks later and we're on episode three. And I thought that this was gonna be the end of it. But that's when I got the Skype call. The Algarve coast, with its amazing beaches, friendly people and great weather, attracts tourists from all over the world. Geologists have developed a scientific theory that the coastline itself was formed by plasma arcing millions of years ago. The cave trip was really interesting because we got there a little bit early and we were surveying the area. Then the drone guys turned up. You know what, get the drone, get the bird up in the air. Let's see if we can see something from the air. Which we actually did. We saw the cave entrance there. Where is that? I'm, I'm not really a big lover of heights, and uh, I'm not really a good swimmer either. Well, it was a little bit uh, risky for me. I was a little bit nervous. an opportunity a window came up and we were contacted by a local Canadian woman that lives here and she said she knew where the cave was so we thought that's a great idea we'll pop down document the cave did he really live in it did he not really live in it you know a lot of people are asking us questions about that so the story grew from there So um, we met up with Carrie and she took us the next morning and showed us exactly where the cave was. And we had to help each other a lot going around the side and you're looking straight down, you know, it's, it's a bit of a drop. So, but it was exciting, you know, it was, um, it made me, um, made me feel alive. It didn't matter if Lee slid off or if I slid off, we could have pulled each other out. But having an extra responsibility of someone in a precarious situation like that was a little bit more responsibility. But she did a great job. She took us in a way. We found the cave. It was an amazing sight when we, when we saw that for our own eyes. But 
when we got to the cave it was like wow the part which struck me the most was how he carved in the the stone king out of the entire landscape there's nothing growing there but right in front of the cave there's a great big bush of local heather and it was the only bush growing anywhere on the entire mountainside we don't know where the water source is for that bush. It's very strange. I've been in the health and fitness industry around about 30 years now. I've been in the Black Belt Hall of Fame three times. Master Instructor, Master of Combat, International Instructor. All right, so how I ended up on this journey was, um, it's a little bit of a story. And just to put the record straight, I am not a religious person. Now, I didn't believe in I wasn't sure, I should say, I wasn't sure whether it was life after death and what happens to people when they die. But um, my ex-wife died a week before we went on the film shoot. And we have a psychic, well we have a few psychics, but the one I use is a lady called Tracy. Anna died on the Saturday morning, I called her on the Sunday morning. And I don't know whether you know about Spain, but when somebody dies in Spain, they bury them really fast. So the funeral was Sunday evening, so I called Tracy on the Sunday morning. And I said, Tracy, see if you can get through to Anna. And she said, listen, Lee, normally the transition period is 10 days or more. And I said, clearly you don't know my ex-missus. She's a Capricorn and everything should have been done yesterday. So um, she got straight through to her, like within seconds, Anna came through. And the first thing she said was trust in what you were doing. So when we started um, digging, it was um, it was interesting because the it was about a six foot by five foot section we had to dig up, and um, we weren't sure what was going to be there. Because it was only three inches under the under the ground, we had to sort of scrape the top off without, you know, digging deep in case we broke something. So when we when we when I scraped the first top of the bottle, I took the the label off it, and then we we're like, wow, we found it! Oh my god! So after that we couldn't wait to get back to talk to Greg because where we were on the side of the, uh, the cliffs there was no phone signal. And um, once we got to the top we were straight on the phone to Greg, so excited, he was so excited as well.
I was lucky enough to have a few moments when the film crew were moving around and I had a few moments alone inside the cave and I switched off all the external distractions. The phone didn't work anyway, but I took a few moments just to absorb the atmosphere and the feeling in there. And there is definitely a, an energy that you can feel. It's very relaxing. It's, I don't know, there's something about the place. It just made me calm way down. I got my breathing right and I had maybe three or four minutes alone in there, which was very nice. The good feeling inside the cave. We found a few things we need to ask you about. You told us to go digging, we dug. So we need to ask you about um, this bottle we found. All right, I'm gonna get in then and- There, oh, I can see something hang on. out. That's got my um, claim to the ownership of the cave wrapped around the bottle. Ah. And I had it um, rolled up with a wax seal inside the bottle. Well, we, now, can't figure, we can't figure that out then because Carrie found the title deed to the cave and the yeah. bottle we found, when we, when we dug it up, the cork was out of the bottle. Well, Someone's dug it up and done something symbolic. Well, yeah, that's, that, that makes sense because the bottle, you can't see it probably, Greg, the bottle is a very expensive bottle of um, Portuguese port. Mm. A really right. nice bottle. Okay, well, what I've got here, you see, this mark here is mm -hmm. the mark of Prince Regent, Duke Governor of the ports of the Algarve. What they've done is they've replaced um, my clear bottle with the ownership to the cave and then inside the bottle with a wax seal on it and they've replaced it with a bottle of port acknowledging this, ports of the Algarve and then wrapped my deeds on the outside of the bottle. That's strange, who do you think did that then? The roast crucians and the Portuguese intelligence, as I had, uh, I was at a birthday dinner with the second in charge of Portuguese intelligence, he was Rosicrucian, and he said that he would be the head of Portuguese intelligence. That night, we pondered the mystery of the switch bottles. Why would someone go to all that trouble for a seemingly valueless artifact? Having been placed in an exact position underneath the word king, in a loving and caring way, surely the bottle must be the clue. And then we saw it, staring at us the whole time. The only words legible on the bottle began with the letters L B V P. We decoded these and it came up with 12.2, which is the book of Genesis, the first part of the Bible, and 22.16, which is the book of Revelations. After yesterday's discoveries, we sent the decoded information to Greg and he asked us to come here to these ancient ruins in a place called Abakeda. Now these are incredibly important and he talks about this in episode one. The biggest secret in the Catholic Church is that there were two Jesuses. In AD 33 to 37, the two Jesuses came here to Portugal and used this building behind me to write the book of Revelations. 
Now there's several important stories that go through the book of Revelations and the number one was the story of Jesus walking on water. Behind us in the distance, there's a huge piece of flat land which used to be coastal. It was destroyed by a very large earthquake. This area before used to have an extensive range of sand that used to hold a very thin amount of water. So from this elevated position, the people that saw Jesus, it looked like he was walking on the water, but he was actually, in fact, only walking on a very thin layer that had been left on the sand deposits after the tide had gone out. Now the two Jesuses were cousins. The second Jesus was his third cousin. But in the Latin countries, Jesus is a very popular name worldwide. It's Jesus in Spanish. As you can see from the aerial shots, which really reveal the shape and form of these ancient ruins, in the center of it, there's a hexagon formation that shows exactly the importance of where we are today. One of the questions you're probably asking yourself is why would the two Jesuses come here to the Algarve, spend four years writing the book of Revelations, for what reason? I asked Greg this specific question and he explained to me it's because of this particular spot holds some very special energy lines that run through the entire planet, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. Greg is far better able to answer those questions than I am. After they'd finished writing the book of Revelations, both Jesus has left this part of the Algarve and they moved on. We're gonna to go to a next location now and explain exactly what happened to the third cousin of the first Jesus and how he built his life in Portugal and the important work that he did during those next few years. After they'd finished writing the book of Revelations, both Jesus is separated and one of them came here to a story. He established himself inside the community as a respectable business person by taking advantage of the amazing local grapes that were grown here and he became a famous winemaker. Hence the story, Jesus turning water into wine. After several years, Jesus settled down and had a family. His popularity grew with inside the community as a famous winemaker. It was at this stage he came up with a brilliant plan to spread Christianity throughout the Roman world by getting one of his sons inside the Roman Empire as a centurion in exchange for accepting the Roman emperors into the secrets of the Egyptian mysteries. By AD 76, Jesus' grandson was born by the name of Hadrian, who went on to become very famous for building a wall across the north of England called Hadrian's Wall, which was the marker point of the Roman Empire's northern outpost. The original location where Jesus settled was of course built on and is now called the Palacio de Estoy. Now there's something very interesting about this location because it's rumored that there was a tunnel used for the initiation ceremony to accept the Roman emperors into the secrets of the Egyptian mysteries. The tunnel lasted approximately 10 miles and was pitch black when they had to walk through it. Another intriguing curiosity involving his story are the garden columns that form a large Christian cross. 
this decodes to the location of the next keeper of the Egyptian secrets and the initiation by Anubis. Navigating around the circumference of the earth to the furthest place possible and adding 88 miles will bring you to Auckland in New Zealand. Going through the center of the earth and adding 77 miles, you arrive at the same location. Biblical secrets that Portugal hides all point in one direction, and that's here to the chapel of a story. Inside this small church, there are more codes and keys to unraveling the mysteries of these biblical predictions than anywhere else in Europe. Here the evidence of the two Jesuses are beautifully recorded on the ceiling and the walls. The statue of Mary gazes lovingly the Holy Grail in its 18 arrows on both sides. 360 degrees divided by 18 is 20, but there's two of them, 2020. Above us, Jesus and the apostles are depicted on the ceiling. Notice the key at the feet of the apostles with the cross inside. At first glance, it looks like there's a second piece of the key that's broken off, but only the ones closer to God can see that it is in fact a second key hidden carefully from the ungodly under the robes of one of the apostles. Guarding the painting of Jesus above and below are two beautifully made eight-pointed stars equating to Anubis and Isis, guardians of the Egyptian mysteries. The dome ceiling represents Ezekiel's wheel and the cherubs that surround him are taken directly from the Bible passages. By all accounts, Jesus lived a full and happy life. He raised a family, he had a successful business and was well loved in the community. On his death, his body was taken from a story and moved to a local location two kilometers from here where his body lay undisturbed until the year 930 when an earthquake shook the building apart and his body was removed by the King of Portugal in another location until 1150. Now I know what you're thinking. What happened to the other Jesus? After they've written the book of Revelations and they left Abacada, that's when the story gets very interesting. One Jesus stayed here in Portugal, the other Jesus took his wife and family. He moved north, spreading Christianity along the way, and eventually settled in a famous place that was to become known as Londinium. Portugal was always a very interesting place for us. Greg spoke about the secrets the Algarve holds. What we found is so important, it needed to be shared with the entire world.